may start coming in. And we are recording. Awesome. So how long have you been, as we sort of, before everyone gets started, um, how long have you been Mac users? Uh, I'll, I'll go. We, we had Macs growing up in my, uh, you know, when I was young. Uh, Apple IIe, I think we had. And then, uh, yeah, moved to a compact laptop in college because Apple laptops were expensive. And then it finally died and I got my 12-inch uh, PowerBook G4, which is still my favorite laptop ever, I think. Um, and haven't looked back since. So I, I used uh, Macs in college and then... Um... I think in 04, I switched my firm over one weekend. I got fed up with PCs, and Fridays we had PCs, and Mondays we had Macs. And um, so we've been all Mac for 16 years now. Wow. That is Ben Stevens, the Mac lawyer. A Mac lawyer. <laughs> the Mac lawyer. Okay. I, I, I would say my first, uh, I, I was fortunate. My grandmother, I think, is almost like, a, like an almost graduation present for my high school. She bought me an Apple II C, and boy, that was the bee's knees, complete with like the the dot matrix printer, right? What was that mm -hmm. called? The Apple Laser Writer or something like that? Oh man, I was great because my friends had a Commodore sixty four, so we had the wars. Like I was better because I had was it Print Shop or Print something? Yeah. But he had Spy versus oh, yes. Spy video game on his computer, but we were we duked it out all the time. Apple was better. I had a Commodore 64 with a cassette drive, Brett. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's what you saved it on, right? That was, I had the Radio Shack TRS, the Trash 80, and that's, that's what I saved my programs on. Yeah. 16 colors, man. I was, yeah. I was, I was, I was making it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we will start in just a couple minutes. Um, and waiting for everyone to join. If you are here, uh, if you saw in the chat, you can introduce yourselves and tell us how long you've been a Mac user, uh, or maybe you're just Mac curious and what's gonna push you over the edge. Um, are you an attorney? If so, what's your practice area? Where are you practicing? Um, are you working remotely? What's top of mind? Ask us your questions. We'll get started in a minute and tell all your friends to join us. They can jump in late if they didn't get the invite. While we're waiting, let me, let me drop a little, uh, little background here. Uh, Brett and I accidentally, the, the way Brett and I met, he's actually in Cleveland where, where I am as well. I'm, I'm in Chardon, he's in Sugar and Falls. And uh, he saw my wife driving my Honda Fit, which was my, which was the company car back then, you know, it was Global Mac Consulting. And I think he saw the sticker. And uh, did he actually talk to her? Or did he just call the number? And is that how I did? Up? I was like, okay, I, I got to track this guy down. So if there's, a, if there's a, if there's somebody driving a car that talks about a Global Mac Consulting, I've got to track him down. He's got to be somewhere close. So I think I Googled for you then at that point and just reached out to you that way. Very nice. And what's cool, I actually gave that car to my mother-in-law who lives with us. We've removed all the stickers, but there's still like, the imprint is still there. When I look in the, in the rear view mirror, I can <laughs> see it go back consulting perfectly, you know, through the, you Just know, the, the halo, the shadow of that, that past time. Yeah. Pretty funny. <laughs> nice. Well, we are at the top of the hour. So welcome everyone who is joining us. And uh, thanks so much for starting to, you know, chime in in the comments. I uh, love hearing where you're from and just wanted to welcome everyone today. So I'm Maddie Martin, the head of growth and education at Smith AI. We are a virtual receptionist and web chat service, uh, primarily focused on attorneys, but also serving many other businesses of different industries. And we operate 24 seven to answer and screen and intake and schedule new potential clients uh, by phone, chat, text, and Facebook now too. So um, I'm excited to introduce our panel. We have Tom Lambot from Global Mac IT, Ben Stevens, a Mac lawyer, and Brett Burney from Burney Consultants. And I will let each of you introduce yourselves and uh, what you're doing here today. What is your level of Mac expertise? So Tom, let's start with you. Thank you, Maddie. Uh, so my name is Tom Lambot. I'm the CEO of Global Mac IT. We're a nationwide managed service provider that only works with law firms that use Macs. 
And so I, I started the company in 2006 back in Santa Cruz and uh, we've grown over time. And since 2014, we haven't brought on a non-legal uh, client. So we've really focused on this kind of, you know, really very specific niche. And so we're primarily a managed service provider. And, and last year I created a couple courses as well to kind of make the uh, kind of IP that we've created supporting Mac-based law firms nationwide, you know, for such a long time, make it accessible to solo attorneys and smaller firms and uh, yeah. Fantastic. Okay, Ben, you're next. So I'm a practicing attorney in Spartanburg, South Carolina. I handle complex family law cases. That's my day job. I've been doing that for 25 years. Uh, my alter ego is the Mac lawyer. Um, started the website back in 2005, six, somewhere in that range. And um, talking about Mac legal technology, my office has been all Mac since 2004. And I also helped co-found the Macs and Law Offices Legal Group, which has 5,000 members and is the largest of its kind in the world. Wow, that is pretty incredible. Brett, uh, bring us home. Let's hear yeah. about you. Well, first, just thanks, Maddie, for setting this up and Tom, too. I got to tell you, I, 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 don't, I don't know if this is wrong to feel this way, but I'm so elated just to be focused on Max, <laughs> talking with lawyers and Max, because I do so many CLEs across the country on e-discovery and other technology. And of course, you know, the vast majority of folks are on Windows. So I am just elated to be here with two great friends. If there's any questions from folks, be sure and uh, put them in. Uh, I'm based out of uh, Ohio, as uh, Tom mentioned. Um, I, I went to law school. I wanted to do anything that had to do with uh, uh, cyber law at the time. That was many, many years ago now and, and trademark issues. But I ended up finding a niche in working with e-discovery. So uh, that uses a big chunk of technology, of course, but it also works on the substantive side of what I do. But a sub niche niche is working with lawyers and legal professionals that want to integrate not just Max into their practice. Tom and I had a chance to write a book for the ABA on using Max, but I do a lot of training on iPhone uh, and iPad, uh, especially like in litigation, using the iPad in litigation, mm -hmm. et cetera. Awesome. Yeah, I think that's actually a really important thing to know is that, you know, we can talk not just about Macs, but also any Mac product. Like you may just think about, you know, a desktop and laptop, but what also about the iPhone and the, the iPad uh, that's relevant here? We can absolutely weave that into the discussion. That's great. Thank you, Brett, for bringing that up. Yeah. Um, you know, first up on the agenda is really talking about security and maintenance. And I think that this is the biggest sort of myth area to debunk. Tom and I have talked about this. And, and even personally, I've used Macs in the past. Um, I don't commit myself to one way or the other right now. But I will say that um, I always had the, the, the preconception, misconception maybe that you didn't really need to do anything security or maintenance wise, that your Mac took care of you. Um, Tell me guys, like, is that true? Uh, how does that apply to lawyers in terms of professional conduct and responsibilities? So, I've been fighting this one for years. You go ahead, Ben. No, I'll say, I'll start and then I'll let you correct me, Tom. Um, so the, the common perception is you don't have to do anything that, that, you're, that you're fine on a Mac. I think a, a, a better, from my perspective, a better way to put it is if you use common sense and don't do anything stupid, you're probably fine on a Mac. Um, typically the problems that I've seen at least that have arisen from Mac users getting infected with something is because they clicked something that they obviously shouldn't have or, you know, created their own headaches to some degree. Um, but, but certainly, you know, Macs are a lot safer and more secure than PCs, but Tom and Brett, you guys can get in the specifics on that. Yeah. The, I, I just put out an article a couple of weeks ago called Vol do Volvo drivers need to wear seatbelts? And the, the idea there is Macs hands down are, you know, infinitely more secure than windows right out of the box. Right. Uh, and Volvos are known as the most secure car, but if you don't take basic preventative measures, you can still get hurt. And, you know, like Ben mentioned, a lot of times, you know, the phishing emails these days are not the ones we used to get five years ago, right. And broken English and asking for $10 million and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I mean, they're getting more and more and more advanced, you know, it's getting more, you know, difficult to spot them out. And, you know, the issue, especially become, it's a bigger issue when you have a team, let's say you're tech savvy, you moved your firm to Mac, so you're comfortable with them. You kind of know what to look out for. But just because that's obvious to you, when the assumption is made that everyone else on your team has the same level 
of uh, kind of awareness, that's when people get into trouble. And so, you know, Macs do get malware. Uh, I haven't seen a virus actually infect a Mac or anything like that from personal experience. I have a, a good amount of it, uh, but you still want to take, you know, a lot of precautions, uh, like using a good, you know, password manager. We'll, we'll get into the more specifics, uh, but I, I think it's, it's an issue when the mindset is, I use a Mac, so I'm good. Right, because if you do have a data breach, we've had law firms that use Macs that have had a data breach, and then you have to, you know, tell everyone in the world and send out the emails to your list and your, you know, I mean, it's a horrible, horrible thing. You know, we had a client before they brought us on, um, they had a data breach literally the month before we started serving them, and he's told me it's cost them hundreds of thousands of dollars in lost revenue easily, not the cost of the actual notice they had to send out, but the lost revenue. The, you know, the damage to your, your, your reputation, the phone stopped ringing. I mean, lost it, potential clients. Yeah. And, and so you have to go above and beyond just being on a Mac does not check the box, you know? So after you, Brett. Yeah. I, I would just say quickly, it's not the technology anymore. Unfortunately, and I'll just say it out loud. It's really, it's the, uh, the, 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 the people factor really, right? <laughs> what we mm -hmm. used to call end user error in a way. And I don't mean that derogatory. I'm just saying that it's really today phishing expeditions. It's just, it's not using grid passwords, that type of thing. It's not the technology anymore today. Windows 10, I think is probably just as secure as what we used to argue that it, uh, Mac was maybe more secure. Yeah, let me, let me add one more thing in real quick. Uh, for, for another good example is dark web. Um, you know, the, the way criminals make their money, they, you know, they, let, let's say Netflix gets hacked and you're like, oh, I don't care if they know that I, you know, watch reruns of, you know, Gilmore Girls, you know, all the time. And it's like, whatever. But the issue, that's, that's not the issue. The issue is right. if you use your work email as your login and a mm -hmm. password that you reuse, which the exactly. overwhelming majority of people reuse their passwords, that's now a threat to your entire living. You know, um, exactly. we use a, a, a software that actually scans a dark web ID continually. Uh, and anytime there's a hit and something comes up, says, hey, we just found a password, check it. Right. Let, let's take a look and see if that's a password that you're using, because uh, if it is, you now need to go and change it everywhere. So good password hygiene. Um, you know, the, the, the biggest threat factors are off of your Mac. Like Brett said, it's phishing. Once you go to the web, boom, you've got a you know, there's a threat there. All of our data is in cloud services. Uh, you know, I once read a story about a, a law firm in Northern California I had three users, right? Tiny firm. Nothing's going to happen to us. Right. The, the, there's a the mindset again. We're too small. Um, and there, I think my case credentials were breached and, you know, a bunch of contacts were accessed and it's a downward hill from there. You know, so. Hey Tom, what, what are your thoughts on password managers? I, I use I one. I was just going to ask that. Awesome. Oh, Thank go. you for reading my mind. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I use topic. one password and love it. What, what, do you, what do you guys use? What do you recommend? Uh, we use one password. Uh, we love it. Absolutely. You know, for our clients, we have a separate solution that's actually built in and included. Um, it's, uh, it's built into MyGlue, which is kind of a kind of records management tool, but it also has the password management as well. Um, one password is just seamless. It works on your iPhone, your iPad, your, you know, you've got your family account, you've got your work account. You know, one password for teams is great business wise because you can create different, you know, kind of categories. So if I want to share something with my executive assistant, boom, I mean, it's, it's instant. You know, she tells me, she's like, oh, I need this password. And, you know, we're on Zoom. I add it literally, I mean, not even one second later. She's like, oh, I got it. You know, so it works really well. Um, and oh, let's one go. Password, password management. So, so such an important topic. Sorry, Tom. Go ahead and finish. The, the best one is the one you use. Yes. Mm, totally. And the one that is used by your team. So yeah. let me ask you a question about password management, but also just access in general. So two-factor authentication. Um, all of these sort of, you know, Google Authenticator and built into the system natively. Uh, my case, you're talking about that breach. There was a password that was used and shared. You know, where does two-factor authentication come in there? Um, do Macs handle that sort of uh, checkpoint differently? Uh, what do Mac users need to know or what does everyone just sort of generally need to know there? Brett. Me? Tom, yes. I was going to let you go. I, I'm, I'm um, biting my tongue because I don't want to be, you know, the only talking head. No, here. go. 
go, 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 because you're uh, the security expert on this. You know, two-factor authentication should be used. I mean, anything out there that has data that is secure should have two-factor authentication enabled. Is it a pain sometimes? Yeah. I don't, you know, my wife tries to log into my Amazon account and she has to ask me for the pin because it sends it to my phone. Yeah, okay, it's annoying. But what's the bigger annoyance here, yeah. right? A data breach and getting massively screwed to the tune of losing tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars or having to use two keys when you unlock something as opposed to one, you know? So I, I think anything that, you know, your email account, your case management software, your file management, whether it's, you know, Dropbox or Box or whatever you're using, anything that has, you know, sensitive information should have two-factor authentication enabled, period. I always call it the tug of war between security and convenience, right? Something that's gonna be very secure is not gonna be very convenient. If it's very convenient, it ain't gonna be secure. So you've got to decide for your own, I guess, well-being or for your, the information of your clients where you're, going to, where you're going to come down on that tug of war. But you always have to deal with that. And, and uh, that's just the way, that's the reality of the world that we live in today. Mm -hmm. and, and most practice management, case management systems, are you, are you all finding that they have an option for two-factor authentication now? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I would say if they don't have two-factor authentication, you got you should reconsider your options or talk to them and say, hey, we want two-factor authentication. Because again, the threat factor, if you don't have that, all you need to get in is the password. If you've inadvertently given, even if you've done nothing and no one on your team has done anything to ever be fished or give out your password, if a third-party website that you have zero control over has a data breach and that's a password that you reuse, then you know you're you, you can you, you know you've got a threat there. That's another benefit of using one password in a password management tool. It's not only about storing all your passwords, but it's about, it's about creating a unique password for every single login that you use. That way, if what you know when Dropbox was hacked or when LinkedIn was hacked, it goes okay, cool. Well, I just have to change my password in LinkedIn. On the flip side, when we first started using uh, Dark Web ID as the tool that we use. Um, on the business side, no one in our team had any data breaches, but I, I did it for my, my at Mac you know, email address. And I saw one that was my primary password that I reused all over the place, you know, before I had good password hygiene. So I had to go in and change 20, 40 passwords. It sucked, but I slept better at the end of the night. And, and they're generating passwords too as well, right? So, I mean, you're not just coming up with them yourself, these password managers, and then we'll get back to the Mac topic because this is kind of general, but you know, those password so managers important. also generate secure passwords. So you don't have to you know, now be an expert in what is a secure password. Yes, I'm going to single out the, the majority of the, the attendees right now. Many of them are going to get you know, kind of hit right in the heart here. I know that you use three passwords. You've got the one you always used. Right. The second one is when your bank said, no, that one's not secure enough. You got to change it. So you're like, okay, I'm an attorney. I'm smart. I'm going to use a dollar sign instead of the S. I'm going to use an exclamation mark instead of the L. And now I've got a super secure password. Okay, guess what? Anyone else can do that. And uh, artificial intelligence, you know, tools can do that automatically. Absolutely. And then the third password is the one that said that one's not secure enough or you've got to change it because it's been 90 days. So you just put a number two at the end and you cycle it every 90 Exclamation days. Exclamation point. Right? Exclamation <laughs> point. Right? So we know that. Uh, and, and again, the, the, the cyber criminals out there know this. It's, it, it's so easy. And one more fact, and I'll, I'll, I'll zip it for a little bit. A few years ago, uh, the Institute, I forget the name of it, big complex government name, the, the, the one that tells you how to be secure, the one that taught everyone in society that says, hey, every 90 days, you should change your passwords. They came out two years ago and they said, hey, you know that advice we gave everyone? It's, it's actually really bad advice. So don't do that anymore. This is a fact. So they don't recommend that practice anymore. Instead, what they recommend is to only change your password when you know that it's been breached. Okay, so how do I know when it's been breached, right? Well, right. And again, that's where using a tool like a dark web scanner, you know, can can tell you as soon as it happens, as soon as it hits the, the, the black market, you know, the dark web where people purchase and sell passwords to try to hack and screw people over, as soon as that hits, you can know about it and change the locks. And, and so that's why you need to have multiple layers of security. That, that, that's what we you know, offer to our clients in, in terms of our security vectors is not just one thing. Oh, use one password and we're done. You know, it, it's using, it, it's 
stacking multiple layers. And that's what really, really is going to help, you know, kind of lock things down. That makes sense. So, I mean, we've talked a bit about security, uh, password management, um, but also what about maintenance for a Mac? I mean, obviously, you know, we're downloading things, we're saving images, maybe you use it for personal and work. Um, what sort of division is required for, especially for an attorney, if you're using your laptop or computer for multiple purposes, especially working from home right now, we see that happening more and more often. Um, and then how you keep it running fast, because that is absolutely something that drives efficiency. There's a, a lot of work to get done. There's a lot of bandwidth consumed with Zoom meetings and things like that. People are doing trials on Zoom. Um, how do we keep our Macs clean running fast um, outside of just being secure? So what we do, um, <clears throat> we have a, a, a vendor uh, that we work with that um, has maintenance on our computers that runs routinely. We're clients of, of Tom's. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, this wasn't a setup question, but they make it so easy. Well, I'll get a pop up on my, on my computer every couple of days. Hey, you need to log out, let us run some maintenance. And hmm. they their magic behind the scenes, and then I log back in the next morning, and, and and I'm good. So it couldn't be easier or more transparent for me because it, it all happens when I'm not here. Um, but but I know there are lots of things that happen because sometimes you know it'll take 45 minutes or an hour to run if it's something really big. Mm -hmm. uh, and I assume that they're not just being mean and you know blocking me off my computer for a little while. Um, Let's make them think we're doing stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so I mean that. You know, honestly, I'm a firm believer that, you know, I will acknowledge most attorneys are cheap by nature. Um, but, you know, I'm a firm believer that, that we know how to practice law. We don't know how to do all this other stuff. And so this is one of those areas that's important enough to spend money to get an expert, whether that's Tom's company or somebody else. But to have people that know what they're doing, make sure you're safe. You know, you're not going to install... Uh, well, I guess you can install security systems at your house now, but they're obviously not as good as, as the ones professionally done. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't see banks installing their own security, so, you know, protection at, the, at their banks. So having an expert involved makes it a lot easier. And, and I don't worry about our security at all because I know we're in good hands. So, Ben, let me ask you a follow up question there specifically and Tom jump in. Um, when you have something like that running and it maybe it takes over your computer to run a software update or there's some data cleanup work or consolidation that, that Tom's program is running or any program like that that's similar is running, how do you prevent that from interrupting your work, interrupting a trial or a client call or, um, you know, is there a smart way of making sure that that doesn't interfere with the actual work you're doing on your Mac? So, so from the user end, Tom can talk about the vendor end, but from the user end, it's really simple. There's a button that I, that I click that says cancel and it runs later. So, okay. um, I mean, there've been times that I, when I was, when we were working out of the office for several weeks, when I finally came back in, I think my computer may have shut down the power went out or something. And so it said, Hey, we've got to run some maintenance. It's going to take X length of time. And I'm like, nah, I can't do that now. So I just click the button and it ran that night. So, and the nice thing is if it doesn't run, I'm bad about not running it on my laptop that often. So it's set up where it'll actually send me an email. Hey dummy, we haven't run, you know, you haven't run the software in such, such and such time, please do so. And it, and it'll remind you again and again, if you ignore the emails. So they do a good job nagging um, to make sure that that's done because, because it's important. Okay. And, and then an, another question here would be, um, you know, if you're provisioning Max for your team, you have staff, you're equipping them with what they need to get their job done. Um, and we can maybe separately talk about contractors and what requirements you might request of them to also use Max or PCs or have security measures in place for that. But specifically with your team, if you are provisioning them uh, a Mac, you've decided you're a Mac based firm, what is the sort of core setup that you install, that you put in place before that Mac is given for use to that team member? Is there also an agreement that's signed for the proper use of that computer? Is it specific to a Mac? Is it specific to the use in a law firm? Um, can we talk a little bit around how to protect your, your firm and your staff themselves when using that equipment? 
So yeah, I mean, I, I could talk a little bit about that, but honestly, I'm a terrible panelist on this topic because I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm sort of in the middle of a lot of things, but not in charge of any of it. I'll tell you what we do. We have a use policy at our firm um, that every employee here has to sign that they're going to use their devices for acceptable use. Um, when we get a new computer, literally all we do is we tell Global Mac, hey, we're getting, my assistant's name is Caitlin. Hey, Caitlin's getting a new computer in two weeks. Um, typically, they'll work with us on determining what type of device we need. But when it comes in, they do the setup, they do the migration, they do everything. So literally, all we have to do is, you know, run a credit card, pay for it, and bring it in the office and turn it on. So it makes it as easy as can be. I mean, in the old days, I would do that myself, and it would be, you know, minimum several hours, maximum a day, back and forth, getting things set up and, and provisioned. But they know the base software that, that we have to have on everybody's workstation and, you know, the, the, the plugins and different things. And so it's literally for us, turn it on, they say it's ready, unplug one, plug the other one in and, and we're ready to go. If I can chime in a little bit on the, on the, on the maintenance to go back to the very you know, first question, um, you know, minimum maintenance on a Mac, you should log out of your computer at least once a week because there's certain maintenance scripts that are built into the system. Some of them can run while you're working on the Mac. Some only work in the background when you're, some, some only work when the computer's logged out. And, and that kind of clears cache. It does all kinds of geeky things I won't bore you with. Uh, but it's just, uh, you know, there's a reason why, you know, turning it off and on again is, is, is a joke, but it's so true. You know, I wanted to make a coffee mug that says, you know, turn it on and off again. Well, those <laughs> exist, obviously. It wouldn't be anything new. Um, so the, the maintenance isn't too complex. You know, some people, they'll leave their computers on for weeks and weeks or months and months, and then it's like, oh, it's so slow. You know, and then you start running is into issues. You're also not having the security patches installed regularly, and then you, you're open to threats and different things. Um, in terms of the software that, that Ben mentioned, uh, this is included with our managed services. Starting last year, we actually opened this up and we made this available to a solo attorney, you know, who just wants to put on their computer. And, and the main thing it does, it runs all the maintenance regularly and has reminders. Uh, in, in terms of what you asked, Maddie, about when updates are installing and interruptions and that kind of thing, one of the coolest thing, in my opinion, of the software is that we have over 50 apps that as soon as we install it, it disables the software update checks. Hmm. Okay, so every time you open Outlook, it's like, oh, Outlook has an update and this has an update, you know, all those go away. So that saves you some interruption time. And then the updates are only installed once we've tested and verified um, that the update itself doesn't introduce new bugs or issues. I know a couple years ago, Excel had a big update that pushed out uh, and both, both Excel and Word had some huge issues and problems, you know, that impacted, you know, millions of people, none of our clients were impacted because they, you know, they didn't get that update yet. Wow. Um, and then the updates only occur when they log out. So usually at the end of the day, we recommend, hey, log out at the end of the day. So it runs all the updates, security updates, even full OS updates. Once we've, you know, kind of checked the box that they're clear to go and, and, and do that, it does it as well. Uh, and, and it scans for malware as well. Um, so... I have, a, I have a couple questions that I see in the chat that I think would be good to answer live. Um, one is in the same vein, what is the best Mac-based antivirus software? Uh, one of the ones that we're, we're fans of is uh, ClamXAV is a good one. That's been an open source one for many, many years. That's actually built into our tool. Uh, another really popular one is Malwarebytes for Mac. Um, and then another that we, we haven't used directly, but I've heard and, and read good things about, it, I think is ESET. Uh, and I'd have to look it up to get the specifics on that okay. one. But Do you want to type it. those into the chat too? And then I'll, I'll send out the notes, uh, everyone, just so you know, if you um, need help with spelling like I do, uh, I'll send the recording and notes from the best practices to everyone after this. Um, so I'll get those from Tom, or you can put it in the chat. The other question is, um, two more questions, and then we'll get back to our agenda. Uh, I've got a 2012 iMac, uh, says one of our guests. I worry about updating to the latest operating system. Is this a legitimate concern? The computer works really well, but I wonder about security updates that I may be missing. I can handle that one. You won't like it, but I can handle it. <laughs> um, <laughs> 
you can handle it as literally like, let me help you. <laughs> yes, Derek, let me take that thing out back and shoot it. Uh, <laughs> no, and, and you know, I say that tongue in cheek, but here, here's, here's, my, here's my very strong opinion on this. You're working on an eight-year-old iMac and you spend the majority of your time working on this computer. And I have a strong belief that you should spend your money where you spend your time. And I, I, one of my clients, he's a great civil rights attorney here in town, Sabo Chandra. Uh, Brett, you've worked with him as well. He had, you know, he had the 17 inch um, MacBook Pro, loved it. You know, the, the owners of those machines are, are kind of diehard and he didn't want to let it go forever. And I think it was five, it was six years old. And I was like, Sabo, get a new one. And he finally broke and got it. He calls me the next day. He's like, Tom, oh my God, this thing is so much faster. And my wife has a MacBook Air that it might be a 2012 or 2013. It's slowing down. It's got issues. But she goes on at 10, 15 minutes a day, if that, right? UPS doesn't drive around, you know, old broken down trucks because they need one that's going to be consistently reliable, you know, and, and work every single time they fire it up. Mm -hmm. And so I actually have an article I wrote called The Cost of Slow that kind of breaks this down. Mm. And it, that, that is actually, that was in our book, uh, our, the Max and Law book that Brett and I wrote. And it breaks down the actual amount of time you spend on your computer and, the, you know, the cost per month. And when you do the math, you're like, oh my God, okay, yeah, I'm just being cheap. And so... My answer to that, get a new one. Thank me later, you know. Uh, sorry about your paycheck, your, 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 your credit there. But uh, no, it, it's going to hurt when you write the check, but it's going to feel good every single time you use it. Uh, for, for our you take care of your future self. I always say that with receptionists, Absolutely. with technology, like you invest now in your future self and they will be grateful when that time comes and they don't have to deal with all those bogging down sort of issues that slow you and, and, and prevent productivity, um, which is, you know, another subject that we're going to get to in just a moment, productivity apps, you know, what can you do besides just, you know, upgrading to a new um, hardware? Uh, what are some of the apps and software that are great for productivity as well that go beyond just the, the hardware speed with the new system? Before, um, but a couple other questions that I want to tackle. Uh, can, I that, on one, can I throw in one thing real quick, Maddie? One yeah. thing, because again, I know attorney being one, I can say this attorneys are thrifty. That's a nice way to say cheap. Mm -hmm. um, one thing we started doing a few years ago was leasing our Macs. Mm. Um, and so every three years we're forced to upgrade, get a new machine. It takes away the sting of the initial upfront cost. The lease rates are, the Mac business people will help set it up is very reasonable. Mm -hmm. um, so that's made it, you know, we didn't do it so much for the cash flow side, which is a nice benefit, but to make sure that our machines are no more than three years old. So that's an easy way to, to solve that problem. Cause I've gotten stuck just like Dirk with the machine all, cause it's working great. And mm -hmm. all of a sudden it's five, six, seven years old. And then, well, I don't want to spend $2,000. Well, if you, if you do it on the front end, it makes it a little easier. And, and that way, you know, you're staying current. Yeah, just same way in the kitchen, you get used to that dull knife and having to press really hard to chop the vegetable, you know, you don't need to press that hard. Okay. Um, so, I mean, Ben, are you willing to share what sort of cost are we looking at for leasing versus buying? I, I don't remember, honestly, um, but it, it was shockingly low. I okay. mean, it, the, the lease factor wasn't, it, it wasn't very, it was a no-brainer. Okay. Um, and again, we were, you know, we've been busy and fortunate. It wasn't a big deal for us to write the check. But it was just so much easier to do that and, and know that know that that's being taken care of. And is there also like a, a warranty and sort of maintenance yeah, element I, there as well? I'm not an extended warranty guy other than Apple Care. I mean, that's the mm -hmm. one extended warranty I always get. Mm -hmm. And I think the lease period and, and the Apple Care line up one to one. And, and we have so rarely had problems with our Macs anyway. Um, but but that that takes care of that that aspect of it as well. But before we jump on, there's one thing about security we didn't talk about that, that I know lawyers are, are terrible about. I do want to mention, and I want to get some feedback from Brett and Tom, um, and that's the subject of VPNs. With everybody working away mm. from their office, um, you know, I still unfortunately hear of attorneys, you know, going to not so much Starbucks these days because of, of coronavirus, but, you know, in the old days, they'd go sit at Starbucks and work on the, you know, the free open Wi-Fi, and God knows what client information they were sharing. So, We've got VPNs on all of our Macs and our, our uh, iPads and all our iOS devices, but Brett and Tom, what, we use Encrypt Me. What do, what do you guys use? What do you recommend? And, and why do you think it's important to do that? Yeah, I'll, I'll just jump in real quick. There's uh, any VPN that you're using is great. <laughs> 
if you're using one. Now, I actually don't use it all the time, but Ben, exactly what you're talking about. Remember in those days, we used to go to Starbucks and, and sit there and have a coffee. Like if I know I'm sitting somewhere and I'm using a free Wi-Fi, right? Completely open Wi-Fi. Then that's when I turn it on sitting there before I send or receive any emails, right? Yeah. If I'm sitting there just surfing on Facebook on my iPhone or something, I may not turn it on, right? It's not, it's not that big of a deal. Although if you can't have it on all the time, that's great. NordVPN, ExpressVPN are two of the ones that people are always talking about. I'll tell you, if you've never used a VPN, in order to get yourself competent about it, to, to have an understanding, one of my favorite services is Tunnel Bear. Tunnel Bear. I'll put the link in just a moment, or, or Mark can, or somebody. Tunnel Bear. It's just, first of all, it's so cute. It's little, it's little teddy bears that <laughs> dig. Yeah, Ben knows. Like when you turn it on on your iPad, the little bear digs a hole, a tunnel, and it. And I, I know I'm not making fun of it. I'm just the fact that it's like it's more um, easier. For, it's easier for folks to sort of relate to that, <laughs> if you will, mm, or at least maybe it's an be. experience. Exactly. In the sense that you can just understand that and you can use it for free. They give you 500 megabytes per month for free. So you can test it out and see how it works. It works on iPhone, iPad, Windows, Mac, everything. And then I think it's like 56 bucks a year for an annual. Some of the others, you can always find deals on it and everything. But again, it's not something that I say that people have to use all the time, but just knowing about it, especially in these days, so that you mm -hmm. can turn it on and have access to it when you need it. Hotels, courthouses, I mean, those are, the, those are the places that I think are insecure, you know, today, although I haven't seen a hotel in six months, but. Um, <laughs> Don't be caught it without it having been set up on your computer, basically. Set it up now so that when you need it, it's ready to go. Right, exactly. And I'm sure that makes Tom happy that I don't get infected and they have to fix it, so. <laughs> You're passing all the tests right now. You didn't know, but joining our panel, Tom was secretly testing you to see what your answer is. This was be. a, do we keep him as a client? Let's see how he does. <laughs> <laughs> The ulterior motive comes out. Um, we have a couple other questions. So uh, I just want to make sure that we tackle before we don't get, you know, too far, far along. Um, so one person asked, I can't copy files from my server anymore. The message is, do, you do not have permission to access the file. Um, you know, he's researched and nothing he's tried has worked. Is this a Mac specific issue? Is this something that we can troubleshoot? I haven't had a server in 10 years. So I am um, <laughs> between uh, net documents and, and Dropbox and so forth. I, I, I'm, a, I'm a big no server fan. Um, mm -hmm. so I don't have any idea personally. Tom, do you run into this ever? Um, I know what he's talking about. I mean, it, it's some kind of issue with file permissions and with Mac OS server. Uh, same thing. We, we've got less than 10% of our clients is probably 5% at this point, you know, still use an on-site server. Um, you know, again, going back to security, it's impossible for you to convince me unless your, you know, computer is not connected to the internet at all, uh, that it's more secure to have a server in house, right? When you've got your data on box or Dropbox or, you know, net documents or whatever it is, they're using, you know, enterprise, Great. They've got one foot thick cement walls, biometrics, armed guards. You can't touch that. You mm -hmm. know, the, 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 the level of security sophistication and coverage, the failover servers, you know, redundant, you know, data in different cities and so forth. You can't touch that. Uh, plus, you know, not to mention, you know, just the hardware cost, right, of buying a new server, even if it's a thousand bucks every three, four or five years, is about the same. And, and then the level of complexity of having to manage users and file shares and permissions, it's, it's, it's a big mess and it's a time suck. And, and you can invest your cash in, in ways that are going to get you way more ROI that are going to, you know, reduce your complexity, increase your, your freedom, you know, making mm -hmm. it easier for you to access your things remotely. You know, I mean, I remember having servers, the power goes out because you have a lightning storm. Now someone's got to roll a truck to your office, whether it's you on a weekend, you know, mm -hmm. or someone else. Uh, and and there's, there's, there's just no good reason to do that. You know, we, we still have a few clients that we find that have them. And first thing we do is, is, uh, you know, move them away from it. Unless there, there's a, and there, there are some good use cases, uh, mm -hmm. but they're, they're few and far between. So, yeah. Makes sense. Um, 
Anything else that uh, we want to catch up on, Brett, Ben, anything else you'd like to add before we move on to uh, uh, the topic of working with PC-based law firms? Password managers. If you're not doing it now, that's your number one takeaway. Start with it. I say, again, one password by far. For everybody here, I love it because I usually say one password. It started off mm -hmm. as a Mac-only app. It is now available everywhere across yes, the board. Right. But I will say, because uh, again, normally I'm talking to a room full of, of folks that are probably Windows users. If you've mm -hmm. never done a password manager before and you know that you need to, like you've got time now, even 10, 15 minutes to understand what it is, LastPass is another one that I will throw out there. Um, mm -hmm. I don't like it near as much as 1Password. I think 1Password is far superior. There's others, Dashlane, and there's several others. I just answered a question from another lawyer this morning he was asking, and these are my top two recommendations. If you've never used one, you can get into LastPass because you can get it's a, there's a free tier, so you can try it out. But once you realize how well it works, number one, either pay for LastPass or switch and pay for 1Password. You mm -hmm. need to pay for this. This is an investment on this as well. Okay, and um, we've got a question like, what about Mac's built-in password manager? Uh, that's yeah. Keychain, right? Yeah, yeah, and I'll, I'll say it, and I'll let Tom jump in as well. Um, I, I see it. I know that Apple is very good at doing this and like coming up with terms. I, I really honestly don't have any issues with how Apple handles their security, at least me personally. If people are using that, I guess that's better than nothing. But it's so critical and so important now that I would say to, to move it. And somebody else was asking about moving that, and I answered mm -hmm. that in there as well. I know you can export your keychain. I mean, the keychain is going to be there. That's part of the iCloud services. You're already paying for that and using that. And that comes up by default. But I have completely switched everything over into one password, not only for the password management, but Tom alluded to this earlier. My, my, uh, my parents are getting uh, older, so I've got all kinds of documents and stuff that I'm collecting and keeping for them. All of that is stored in 1Password because I know I can access it wherever I am. And it's so great that I, I love using 1Password even on my iPhone. Like I can just mm -hmm. jump in there and be able to access any website that I need with all, or credit card information, all that kind of stuff is available in there. Hey, Jessica. Uh, Jessica's one of our clients as well. Good to see you here. Uh, I'd say same thing. You know, the, the main thing, what's the big difference between 1Password and kind of the keychain, you know, keychain access, the built-in one? And I think the main thing is, is the ease of use. And in my mind, one of the most important things of using a password manager is creating unique passwords every single time. So the more friction you can reduce out of that whole process, creating a new unique password and saving it and being able mm -hmm. to access it, the more you're going to, you know, use and leverage, you know, the, the, the password management tool. And like Brett said, on iOS, you can actually change it. So by default, whenever you log into a password, instead of going to the built-in keychain, you know, in iOS, it goes to one password. It mm -hmm. uses face ID. You know, I mean, they've made it so much better in the past few years. Before, you still had to open the app separately. There, there were different steps to jump through. Those are gone now. Um, well, as, also... Uh, PC, you know, PC or Mac, or maybe there are some firms that allow you to have, you know, a PC or a Mac, maybe it's each other's preference, using a separate password manager would be the preferred and maybe only possible approach, right? If you're stuck Absolutely. with Keychain, then you cannot share across with other PCs. Yeah, I didn't mean to bring all this back to password managers, but it's that important. <laughs> it but is. that's great. That's Maddie, that's a perfect example because I use Windows computers all the time. And that's exactly how I can get access to it is the fact that it's something that synchronizes across everything, not just Apple products. Yeah, and you may find that your phone is not necessarily, you know, an Apple product, right? So there may be other devices. It may not just be the case that you've got, you know, different people on your team who use different laptops of a PC or a Mac, but maybe you just prefer to not have, you know, an iPhone. Um, I know, crazy thought, but um, it makes you untethered to actually the hardware manufacturer in, in a good way. Another question, um, I don't... Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Tom. Enough security stuff. <laughs> All right, we'll get to the. We'll There's get to always the fun more stuff. security stuff. I, I've got, if you want more security, always. so shoot me an email. I've got plenty of reports on like 10 security tips you got to do for your Mac and all that stuff. We I'm will share tons of resources with you guys from everyone here and their contact info. 
um, which I promise without asking them, but I hope that's okay, uh, to get in touch with them after this. There are more questions than uh, we can possibly fill in an hour. Um, there is one more around getting uh, into forms that are online that only work on Microsoft Edge and not Chrome or Safari. Um, who knows why that would be the case, but um, why does it only work on Edge and is there any way around it? Well, this, this is one of the legacies. I know I've had this question many, many times for years. Some courts only, back in the day, it would only be available on Internet Explorer. Right. Ben knows what I'm talking about. Uh, my, my quick recommendation on that is uh, probably not, you, you, some people will use, and Ben has done this too, will use Parallels or they'll use some kind of Windows virtualization software. I don't like you firing up a whole version of Windows to do that, but if you go to a company called Code Weavers, CodeWeavers.com, they have a um, oh, what, what do they what do they call it? Oh, crossover, crossover, where you can basically just run a version of Windows-based Internet Explorer inside that uh, crossover application. So you're not running full Windows, but you're basically just running that IE. I mean, whoever is running this and requiring this is way back in the prehistoric days, but I know that some courts are there. So that would be the, the only recommendation. Thank you, Mark has put another URL. He's, nice. he's like our silent partner in this. I love it. Thank, Thank you, Mark. Mark. Yeah, Mark, Mark Unger, awesome. Thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you for your service. Um, so we, okay, let's move on to the, the next agenda item. I think, you know, as, as we're, only here with another um, 18 minutes. Uh, are there any considerations uh, when working with PC-based uh, law firms and even possibly vendors or contractors or other sort of network partners, uh, accountants, uh, um, financial advisors, other people who you might work with alongside on a case? Um, are there any sort of like stumbling points to be aware of or, or dare I say again, security uh, concerns? I mean, I, I'll jump in real quick. I mean, for, from my practice, not really. Um, the majority of, of what we use when we work with others would be Microsoft Office, you know, Word, Excel type documents. And those are seamless back and forth. So we've had no problems with that. Um, you know, there are the, one of the child support calculation programs in South Carolina is PC based. There's some, uh, you know, every, since everything is migrated to the web now, it's really become much less of an issue than it was five years and especially 10 years ago. So it's rare that we run into anything like that. In fact, the main thing that we may run into is, is uh, Mac OS versus iOS, you know, getting things ready for trial, wanting to get them on trial pad. Um, I mean, I run into that type of issue a lot more often than I do Mac to PC. Um, so maybe that's unique to me in my practice area, but I will just tell you in, in the speaking that I've done, I, I think that's pretty common. Brett, what do you, you see? Yeah, I would say lot? not anymore. This used to be a huge deal because, for example, Microsoft Office for the Mac, we had a different version than what the people use on the Windows. And in some cases, what they call the fidelity of the document didn't always hold true. Or on the Mac, we would use Pages as basically Apple's word processor, right? Which wouldn't convert always beautifully into Microsoft Word or people, you know, you'd have to, you'd have to export it out as Microsoft Word. Mm -hmm. Just such a pain. But now, a few years ago, Microsoft basically just uh, made it a level playing field, as it were, so that everybody, no matter what device you're using, you're all working on the same kind of versions of not just like the software that were used, even though that is the same, but it's really has to do with what, that's why they changed from .doc to .docx, right? It was the huh. XML back, back end of the That file was the format. unification. Exactly. Well, that, mm -hmm. that helped tremendously on that, right? So that now I, nobody knows or cares what you use to create a Word document, kind of to Ben's point. The documents now are almost seamless. That used to be a huge deal back in the day. And or it was, it used to only be that there was Windows based software, right? You could only use legal software that was designed only for Windows, which I don't blame them because they looked at the market. They knew that the vast majority of lawyers used Windows. So they would only have a Windows version of that software. And we couldn't run that on the Mac side. So mm -hmm. I know Ben is famous. He used to have a Windows computer in the corner of his office just to run that one little piece of software. Mm -hmm. But now today with the cloud, we can access everything. Tom and I wrote about this in our book because 
it's just more than ever before you have the, the freedom, as it were, and the capability to run your practice on the devices that you choose to run and you're not forced into something else. And is there an obligation? I mean, I, I could see scenarios where particularly difficult customer, um, so to speak, opposing counsel could use Keynote as a really difficult point of struggling around a presentation for a trial or something. I mean, are people trying to use like these friction points to their advantage ever? Like, is it a requirement sort of imposed by uh, the court system where you have to use an accessible tool that is available to both PC and Mac. Has that ever come up? From a presentation side, no. I mean, basically, they'll just give you an HDMI plug or VGA, whatever they're using, mm -hmm. and you present however you want to, whether that's uh, Keynote or, again, TrialPad or some of the other software. There are lots of ways to do that. I, the, the court, as, as little as attorneys know about technology, the, the court staff a lot of time is even less, and they here's the plug, here's the screen, good luck. And, and that's really all they want to do. And that's candidly all they should. I mean, that, mm -hmm. they put themselves in a bad spot getting in the middle there. Got it. Um, so let's use the last like, you know, 15 minutes here as sort of a free for all sharing of your favorite apps. We were talking a lot about productivity. I would love for you guys to share with our audience here and anyone who tunes in later, what are the apps that you love for productivity, uh, for, for work, for collaboration, especially as we're working remotely now? Um, and, and, you know, how accessible are they? If there's a price, how much does it cost? I've got one I can share here. Um, whoa, extreme close up. <laughs> so if you've ever had a, you know, everyone's on Zoom all the time here. And so this, this is my normal kind of full screen background, mm -hmm. um, but I don't think your head should be tiny in the screen, right? And so there's an add-on uh, called eyeglasses. I'll send a link. It's not E-Y-E, -E, it's eyeglasses. And it gives you the functionality to kind of zoom in and move around so you can really, you know, center your head. It's got the goofy, uh, you know, if you want to say, all right, I'm, I'm going to do a Zoom presentation in chipmunk mode. Uh, if you want, you can do that. Or, or if you're love struck, because Brett wow. just says something so wonderful, nice. you know, it's got all those, uh, uh, you know, pointless features is what I call them. Uh, but, but the zooming in, you know, is, is really handy. You can also adjust kind of the, you know, the temperature, color, and that kind of stuff. So you can make sure your image is nice. So it's really practical uh, and it integrates directly with Zoom. Uh, so it just shows up as one of your separate cameras. Uh, the software itself, I want to say is 10, 15 bucks. I'm going to send the link here uh, to everyone while someone else goes. It's 20 bucks for a lifetime license. Um, so that's mine. Very cool. And nice well for done. professional Mark, Mark beat me to it. Thank you, Mark. He's on it. Oh, okay. I, I, I'll, I'll throw in the top, I think, of everything is Text Expander. I'm going to say probably the vast majority of people on the call already uh, have known about Text Expander. We don't have to go into a whole lot of detail. But I always explain it to folks, if you haven't used it, like back when I was in law school, I would always have to type United States Supreme Court, right? The entire thing, because I was taking notes, of course, on a nine pound gateway laptop and I would lug around with myself. But it's like, I hated having to type that entire sentence the, all the time. And I had to capitalize the U and of course, because I had to make it look perfect. Well, I used Word's autocorrect feature. When I typed S-U-P-C-T, it would autocorrect, right? To get that whole string of text. But now I use Text Expander that I can do that anywhere. In email, I do it for my phone number or like for a date. I don't stop what I'm doing and look up a date. I just have a little snippet that I use in Text Expander to type that today's date when mm -hmm. I need it, wherever I am. So I don't have to stop and do anything. Or I do that for my email address or my phone number or my snail mail address. Text Expander to me is one of the top productivity tools that now anybody can use. Not just Macs. It works on right. iOS as well as Windows. And you can share them across. I mean, to have that on your phone yeah. is really efficient. Also, even for social media, if you're constantly typing things and you have a professional presence or referrals or you want to share your business information, we see that as very productive in the Facebook groups that we're in with attorneys. They're you know, referring back and forth. How does someone get in touch with you? Even virtual business cards they're sharing. But it's really nice to be able to not only have like a you know, phrase replacement, as Brett was mentioning, but also a, a paragraph replacement with links um, and, and things like that. So yeah. you have actually a pretty robust feature set uh, available with Text Expander, and it's unbelievably cheap. 
Well, can I just say quickly, you know, Tom put in the chat there, he saves two hours a month on average. There's, there's very little software that will actually show you exactly how much time you're saving. So if you calculate that with your hourly billing rate, you see exactly when it pays for itself, which but is Brett, wonderful on there. But Brett, they charge you every single month. <laughs> it's, like, it, it it's like three dollars and 33 cents a right. month is what it is and you can even get a discount in fact i liked it so much you don't have to take the course but if you go to texasmanforlawyers.com you can watch a little video there of how it works that mark, my course is there don't buy the course just watch the video so you can get a better idea of what it looks like mark's on it he shared the link <laughs> thank you cool all right ben so, let's hear your favorite app yeah so so i'm gonna throw you a curveball um I hate email, but I love talking about email. So one of my favorite productivity hacks is using um, email planners to help you snooze email, send emails at different times and different things like that. Um, I use Outlook a lot during the day for work, but there's also an email program called Spark. Um, it's from Riedel, Riedel, Brett, what, how do you say? Riedel, I think. Okay, Riedel. Riedel, we'll go with Riedel. Um, the nice thing about it is it's so easy to snooze emails and say, show me this email three hours later, show it to me tonight in the morning, send this tonight in the morning, those types of things. And so I can keep my email box, my inbox very clean to look at the ones I want to look at now and things I want to read this weekend. I snooze it, it pops back up at the top of my email list on, on the weekend or when I tell it to, and it gives me control over email instead of it controlling me. There's a plugin called Boomerang that will plug into Outlook and some different things that'll do similar uh, functionality, but Spark just has it baked right into to its software, and it's it's a very slick program. I use it um, as much or more than I use Outlook. Um, oh yeah, and we use Front. I just put in the chat. Um, Front allows you to also collaborate within the thread. I mean, that is totally life changing to have, whether you're on a PC or on a Mac, to have a conversation within an email thread actually in sequence, like um, sequentially based on the time, right? So you can right. see an email, a conversation, an email, a conversation, and you can at mention and tag people. Yeah. You can assign the email, you can monitor and snooze yourself even if it's not been assigned to you. And you can have shared inboxes for visibility. And the beautiful thing is that you never have to ask for clarification. Everyone who's having the conversation can see the entire context of the conversation right there. And it speeds up decision making and collaboration significantly. Sure. Yeah. And Spark's got, they have a team product that you can chat within your team about emails mm -hmm. that doesn't show in the email itself. But, you know, I mean, the reality is attorneys these days, particularly litigators like me, we spend hours per day in email. I used to hate voicemail. I've gotten over that. And now I just detest email because it's, it's just a mountain. It, it's always coming at me. I never get caught up, but this gives me the ability at least for the things that I want to do, want to read, want to respond to, or to remind me, Hey, I'm, I'm emailing Brett about this. If he doesn't respond by tomorrow at noon, let me know. And it pops back up. That's one less thing I don't have to remember. Um, and so big fan of that. One of the things that also is really nice with those programs is you can often with their open API or through their Zapier Zap, you can connect them to other systems. So for example, what we do is we connect Front or whatever email program you're using, but in our case, Front to Slack. And we can have a, you know, SLA, a standard setup that if it's not responded to within, let's say, an hour or two hours or whatever the tolerance is, it can alert the team in a shared channel in Slack to say, maybe front's not open for you or that window's not showing up. But in Slack, we know that's open and we know it makes a loud noise when a new message comes through that needs to alert you, time to pay attention to this thing. And you can even assign a teammate uh, in front using Slack. So um, you can take care of the work right then and there. You don't have to switch applications. So one of the other, one of the other things I'm curious about to hear Brett and Tom's take on is PDF programs. I use, I use, I'm not a huge um, Acrobat fan for different reasons. We have it. We use it a lot. I use Preview when I'm on my, my iMac. Um, iOS, I like PDF Expert a lot. That's my, my go-to. And I use iAnnotate a lot. But attorneys work with PDFs all the time. I always like when I talk with other attorneys about tech stuff to find out what PDF programs they use and why they like one over the other. Uh, as far as us, we recommend um, Adobe DC, right? So Adobe, um, that's just, the, you know, it's got all the features and bells and whistles you need. Again, I think it's 10 or 15 bucks a month, uh, you know, 
many of our clients also use PDF Expert. Personally, I'm not a fan. I, I, I've never liked their UI. I don't find it intuitive. I find myself getting pissed off at the app. The, the few times I need to use it, I'm just like, what the heck does this way. icon mean? And it, you know, I, I kind of get lost in it. Now, I'm not an expert. I don't do a lot of advanced kind of PDF management. I don't have those needs. Um, but a lot of our clients do like it because you, you, know, you buy it once and you're done. But again, the, the, you know, it, it's the same conversation we had about the 2012 Mac early on. It's like, what are the core apps that you use a lot? And if you work in PDFs and you need to use those features often, get the best damn thing. And if it's only 15 bucks a month, right? I mean, how much time do you need to, you know, I, I know PDF Expert added bait stamping, you know, a little while ago, but how much time was spent before that was built in for people to find workarounds? You know, you're going to spend 20, 30 minutes Googling around, 30 trial and error, boom, there's an hour. Right, where if you spend 15 bucks, you just got the best tool for the job and you've got all the features built in. So that, that's my take on uh, kind of PDF managers. Yeah, I would say uh, as, as, as uh, seamless as it is to work with so much like from a creative aspect on the Macs, I wish there was a better PDF option, but I'm totally with, with Tom. If this is something, I always typically say for, for legal professionals, the two major software investments not purchases, investments you need to make is Microsoft Office 365 and a subscription to Acrobat DC. Now, I know a lot of people don't do Acrobat D D DC. And even if you have Acrobat, typically I say my default PDF app that I open PDFs with is still preview, Ben, just like you were saying. It's yeah. fast, it's built in, it it's does exactly what I need. But if I know that I need to do more, I go right click on the file and then do open in. Now, exactly what, what Tom is saying, PDF expert on the Mac, I use that. I think it's got a very good like file reduction tool in there. They do have now where you can add a header and a footer for bait stamping, but it doesn't do like OCR, right? So I have to go to a different application that I do for that. There's PDF Pen or PDF Pen Pro that does very good OCR, but they don't do some of the other things on there. So it's unfortunate that this is one area I don't think is the greatest, but if it's something that you need, you've got to make the investment in Acrobat DC. So it is about 15 bucks per user per year on that. But there's a lot of other things that come with it. And frankly, you can use that again, even with your iOS apps uh, devices as well. Yeah. And actually the iOS app is excellent from yeah. uh, Adobe. Uh, so fantastic guys. Thank you so much for joining me today. Um, we've got two minutes left. Uh, we will share in the sort of follow-up if you want to put in the chat how to reach you, but also in the email that I send, um, I will include that information. Um, Tom, can you also share the name of the book and Ben, any resources that they can use to reach you besides email? Yes, yeah, so I, or, or yeah, I, I put the book in the chat a little bit earlier, but it's called Max in Law and it's available through the American Bar Association. Um, you can reach me by just shooting an email, tom at globalmacit.com. And then if you're interested, uh, I'm actually, I, I created a, a, a new guide for everyone, for the attendees here that I don't think it's finished up, so it might, we might send it out next week, uh, but it's called 33 Stupid Simple Mac Tips. And so I've got a weekly Those email series. I try to focus on making it less than 300 words every single time. And I, I cut off all the, all the chit chat and all the bull crap that's not actually useful. So it's just like short. There's so many things your Mac can do that most people never tap into. And so every single week we send one of these quick short emails out and I get a lot of good feedback on them. And, and I've put a little guide that kind of has the first 33 in there. You're guaranteed to find some good ideas to boost your productivity. So Awesome. Those are great tips, by the way. Tom's been killing it on those tips. They're great. Thank you, Brad. And we share the link to that, I think, Tom, in the original registration page. So if you go back to that, you'll be able to sign up for it. Um, go to Tom's bio on that page and you'll see the link. Cool. Uh, ben? Daddy, I'm, I'm real easy to find, but, but I found one of the keys to success in life is to surround yourself with smart people. So if people really want to know these tech questions, the best thing to do is join Milo. The easiest way to do that is to go to themaclawyer.com. There's a button on there that says join Maximal Office. Click that, put your information in. We'll get it approved. It's free. 5,000 of the best legal technology minds in the world in that group. And they're going to be able to tell you a lot more than I can. So I would kind of push off to that. Um, the, the Mac Lawyer site is there. It's not as, as active as it once was. But, but that, the, the ability to sign up to Milo through that is probably the best thing it does these days. So that's the easiest way to, to do that. Fantastic. Brett. 
Hey, so Manny, I was just going to answer. Mark Unger had a question in there and I just wanted to throw one out. Sure. Like what are the best presentation tools for working with Zoom? I got to mm -hmm. tell you, I still work with so many people that take their iPad or they used to take their iPad. Somebody was asking about trial pad in there. One of the ways that I still work through Zoom is I will present from my iPad through my laptop, which is where Zoom is happening, but I use an application called Air Server. So Mark, you can just look up airserver.com and it's, I think it's like $15, $20. Basically it acts, has my MacBook act as if it were an Air Server, right? So then basically when I can share, I can go in and share my screen through the laptop mm -hmm. and it works fantastic on Zoom. Now Zoom also has a built-in kind of an iPad or iOS connectivity thing, but I love using Air Server because it makes it look like it's a different uh, uh, monitor on there. And then lastly, just quickly, I'll throw in probably one of my more fun sites that I've started up is called Apps in Law. It's a little blog I've been doing for several years where I do little short video reviews of different apps. I just did one on uh, using Zoom on iOS devices uh, several weeks ago. And it, the thing is blowing up on YouTube. But if you go to appsinlaw.com, I do a podcast there and, and uh, also have uh, some of those videos. Awesome. Guys, well, thank, thank you, you so much. <laughs> um, and, and Stephen, great question. Yes, I have taken a ton of notes and I will take all of Mark's links and I will share with you every resource that we have um, amassed here today. And uh, we'll send that out along with the recording of this video later today. And just wanted to say thank you for everyone. A special shout out to Mark Unger, for yes. uh, just you know, running the ball for us today on the, on the you, chat. Mike. And uh, Tom, Ben, Brett, this has been a phenomenal, very helpful, constructive conversation. And I hope that everyone got a ton out of it. Um, Tom's feeling the love. So thank Good. you all. Have a great rest of your day and talk to you soon. Thanks guys. Bye everyone, thank you. See Bye you. everyone.